The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. We get a lot of questions on the community about when it's appropriate to use Raspberry Pis, microcontrollers, or discrete logic. We're going to talk about the differences between those and how they apply to your projects. We'll also use past episodes as an example of when and when not to use them. Let's get started. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. Let's start by talking about discrete logic. Discrete logic is when you build circuits using individual chips like AND gates, amplifiers, 555 timers, etc. The strengths of discrete logic are you don't have to program anything, everything's done with low level logic. It works at a very high speed. Technically, there is a few nanoseconds of lag in the chips, and sometimes that matters if you're doing high speed applications, but for all intents and purposes, it doesn't really matter, so it's instantaneous, more or less. And if you go online and are trying to learn about circuits, there's many, many examples of circuits and all the circuits that you're gonna find pretty much all use discrete logic. Weaknesses of discrete logic. Multiple components are needed for even the simplest tasks. So yes, you can find example circuits online, but it's gonna take you a while to wire them all together. More parts also means more power consumption. You've basically just complicated your design. And small variations in integrated circuits can cause circuits to fail. Uh, a recent example, I think it was the Apple One. I was just grabbing a NAND gate that I had a pile of, and it was a NAND gate with open collector inputs, so it wouldn't work with my circuit. So just because you have two NAND gates doesn't mean they're the same. So when you're going for grab bags of parts, that can be a negative. So let's look at some examples of discrete logic in past episodes. If you go to element14.com forward slash TBHS, not only can you view the most recent Ben Heck Show episodes, but you can go to the archives and see every episode we've ever done, dating back to 2010. Episode 64, we did a glue logic robot, and we actually still have it here as well. I mean, we've taken a few parts off of it. Now, the reason glue logic was good for this was because the robot was really simple. It would just go forward until it hit a wall and then it would turn away from that wall and continue going forward. And we we're able to do all that logic using a uh, AND gate, a NOT gate, and three 555 timers. One timer for each servo wheel, and another timer to tell it how long to actually turn until it starts moving forward again. So the reason we didn't use a microcontroller for this, well, it was, it was an example of discrete logic, so that's the reason why we didn't use a microcontroller. Of course, you could use a microcontroller and it would, the robot would be a lot smarter, but this was to prove that you can get some logic out of logic chips. That sounds obvious, but it isn't always. <laughs> and as far as this is concerned, the reason we didn't use a Raspberry Pi is it would have been just way too much overkill. I mean, if this can be done with discrete logic, you certainly don't need a Raspberry Pi. But yeah, that was episode 64, and it's still, Still laying around in one piece. Well, it looks like its traction wheels are falling apart. Ew. If you check out the old episode, number 64, you can find out how I put this together and see it in action. But yes, example of discrete logic. Another project that started at least as glue logic was the anti pickpocket wallet, episode 110. I'm gonna take a look at it here for old time's sake. Ah, uh, yes, that was the old shop. Oh, that's when we had Theater of Magic and Attack from Mars in the background. Anyway, the original thought was, you know, if someone took your wallet and if they were pickpocketing it, they would hold it in a different way than you would pull it out of your pocket. So we thought, okay, it's simple, it's a switch. So basically, if you touch it this way, it sets off an alarm, but if you touch it this way, it's fine. So we started it with discrete logic because we thought it would be simple, but then we ended up having a timer, a few gates, the um, touch circuit, you know, for the capacitive touch, and it just ended up being a little bit too much. So we ended up actually dialing that one back. So discrete was not appropriate, and a microcontroller was. When we switched it to be a microcontroller project, all we had was one microcontroller and one touch controller. So it was a good example of, ooh, discrete logic is a good idea. Oh wait, it isn't. So that was the problem we had with that episode where discrete logic started out as a good idea, but then it became too complicated and a microcontroller was a simpler idea. And also we had trouble interfacing the 
touch sensor with the dedicated discrete logic. Next, let's look at microcontrollers. This is probably the most general purpose thing that we use on the show. The strengths of microcontrollers are low cost. One little chip can do quite a few things. You don't always need a lot of external components because they're all in it because it's a microcontroller, not just a CPU, it can also control things. Uh, they have an immediate boot. Uh, you turn them on, boom, they're working. It's near instantaneous usually. Uh, libraries allow you to add only what's needed. So if you need your microcontroller to do, you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you can just add those things. You know, basically it's code that does it rather than external hardware, which is nice. And there's real-time execution of code and interrupts that allow accurate timing. Uh, on a Raspberry Pi, for instance, you've got a Linux kernel going, so you don't exactly know when things are executing. With a microcontroller, you can use low-level code and interrupts and know exactly when something ha is happening. So if you need something to happen 1,000 times a second, you can create an interrupt and that code will happen 1,000 times a second. Weaknesses. <laughs> I know this is a strength, but it requires special modules slash libraries for most tasks. So you have to find the library you need for your application and you might not always be able to find the library. You might not know how to use it. You might not know how the code works. The libraries usually make it simple, but you know, you still have to wade through all of that. Typically the microcontrollers are going to have a lower speed than a Raspberry Pi, 16 megahertz, 80 megahertz, 40 megahertz are all pretty common versus what's a Raspberry Pi, 700 megahertz. Um, things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the things you take for granted on a Raspberry Pi are more difficult to add to a microcontroller. Again, those things are going to require external circuitry, whereas you know your Raspberry Pi can do a lot of that stuff right out of the box. And there's less program area and RAM than an ARM-based system. You know, even a large microcontroller is only gonna have like half a megabyte of program space and 128K of RAM versus a Raspberry Pi, which has what, 512 megabytes of RAM. So there's a big difference in the program area. Of course, microcontrollers are meant for embedded use. So, you know, you're not gonna need as much RAM. There's a lot of examples of microcontrollers in past episodes of the show. Let's pick the two most pertinent ones. A great example of microcontrollers is my favorite episode, Robot Luggage, number 38 from back in 2012. The premise of this episode was it would be a piece of luggage that would follow you around an airport so you didn't have to carry it. So you could be carrying other things like a coffee or a cell phone and not carrying your luggage. The reason we went with a microcontroller was we needed it to have an immediate boot. As soon as you turned it on, it needed to be able to follow you because we were talking about, you know, quick going through an airport. So immediate boot was a really useful thing. That one of the reasons we use a microcontroller. Also, we could do pretty decent math, like floating point math. Uh, we didn't have obviously nearly as much computational power as a Raspberry Pi or an ARM, but we had enough to make it work. The reason we didn't use discrete logic in that project is we would have needed a ton of it. The whole piece of luggage would have been filled with logic. So definitely not appropriate for that. As far as the Raspberry Pi, honestly, um, a real commercial version of robot luggage would need a better processor. You would need not only just the logic to move left and right and follow a signal, but you'd have to have object avoidance, uh, object detection. So you probably would need a fairly decent arm in there. But for our purposes, you know, just testing out the basic theory in an empty parking lot, a microcontroller was fine. We also used a microcontroller in episode 50, where we built an automatic plant rotator. The idea is the side toward the sun always grows better. So it would rotate your plant, I think like once a day so that it was evenly affected by the sun. So making a plant rotate, we could have used a 555, but it would have been a really slow 555 timer, like, you know, only triggering a couple times a day. So for something like that, you might as well just use a microcontroller so you can just count up a very large number at a one second interval. So you can say every second, count one interval and then after a thousand intervals or a thousand seconds, then move the plant. With microcontroller, you have a lot more control over uh, specific things like that and you don't have to worry about trying to figure out the timing with external circuitry, you just do it with a program. And you have a single AT Tiny, it's already a DIP8, it's the same size as a 555, but it's a lot smarter. 
And you know, you're gonna have a few external components no matter what, so you might as well stick a microcontroller in there. So yeah, that's a good example of, we could, rotating plant is a good example of something where we could have used discrete logic, but it was just a lot simpler to use a microcontroller. And now the plant is much bigger than it was two years ago because we put it in a bigger pot. If we put it in an even bigger pot, it would grow even more. But I think it's big enough. A microcontroller is more complicated than doing this with a 555 or discrete logic, but a Raspberry Pi would have been really, really way overboard. So when you have something simple like just blinking a light or a timer, you really don't need a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is more for internet, vision control, graphics, multitasking, things like that, not rotating plants. I guess you could just go up to your plant and rotate it every day manually, but you know, why should we do that when machines can do it for us? Our final example is a Raspberry Pi or similar ARM-based system. Strengths operating system, that's a pretty big strength. It's like a real computer. It is a real computer. And with a real operating system, you also have easy access to networking features such as Wi-Fi, internet. So if you want to build something that can access the internet, you know, like an internet of things, a Raspberry Pi is a great choice. Also, you get a lot of graphics and memory. As I mentioned earlier, you get like half a gigabyte of memory with a Raspberry Pi versus a few hundred kilobytes maximum with a microcontroller. And of course, another thing about the operating system is you can do real multitasking with Linux. You have many threads going on. Some could be your program, some of the operating system. It's a real multitasking computer. However, a lot of these strengths also lead into the weaknesses. You have an operating system, which means you have a slow boot, at least compared to a microcontroller. It depends on what you're using for your flash memory, but SD cards aren't super fast when it comes to booting. So Raspberry Pi is gonna be better for something that you just turn it on and then you leave it on for a while instead of quick on, quick off, quick on, which you know microcontroller would be better suited for. It's not in real time. You've got an operating system, but you don't know exactly when things are executing. You can get a real time operating system, but Raspberry Pi stock with a non real time operating system. You also have limited IO and IO speed. You know, the newer Raspberry Pis have more IO, but still it's not as much as some larger microcontrollers. And also with being a non real time system and multiple threads going on, you don't know exactly how fast your IO is going to be. So for timing critical things like PWM or servos, it's not gonna work as well or be as easy to use as a microcontroller. And finally, this is something people don't always think about, SD cards can deteriorate over time. SD card is a type of flash memory, but all flash memory has a limited number of write cycles. You can read it as much as you want, but writing it is where there's a finite life. It's usually like 100,000 cycles, which is a lot. You know, if you have an SD card and you're just taking photos with it, you know, I'm not gonna take 100,000 photos anytime soon, but, Operating systems are always doing things in the background and if they're using the SD card as a file system, they'll get to 100,000 writes eventually. You know, it's, it'll definitely happen sooner than later. Newer Raspberry Pis have built-in flash that's not an SD card. Uh, the uh, compute module has that for instance. So anyway, long-term life of your SD card flash system is also going to be a possible concern with the Raspberry Pi. So if your project has to sit on the side of a mountain for 50 years, an SD card is probably not your best choice. Whereas the flash retention on a typical microcontroller is usually guaranteed to be at least 70 or 80 years. Let's look at some of our past projects and see where Raspberry Pi came in handy. A great example of a Raspberry Pi project was episode 152, the point and shoot camera. Felix found some software that would turn a Raspberry Pi into a point and shoot camera, as well as an LCD screen, so we just had to miniaturize everything down into a small package. Why the Pi? Well, you have direct access to the camera using the IO bus and the Raspberry Pi camera module. It basically is meant to work with the Pi instead of a generic USB camera. There's an SD card as part of the Raspberry Pi system, so you can save photos to the SD card and remove the card and retrieve them with another computer. And of course, the Raspberry Pi allows for an LCD display, which is great for seeing what you're taking photos of. So yeah, all those things add up to being very appropriate for Raspberry Pi. You need a Raspberry Pi to save to an SD, look at an LCD, 
and also save in JPEG compression. You know, that would be harder to do with a microcontroller unit. Uh, we didn't use a microcontroller because as I just mentioned, uh, even if you could do those things with a microcontroller, it would at least be slower and probably not work as well. I mean, you could save to an SD card, but it wouldn't do it as quickly. If you did get an LCD to work, the refresh rate would be really poor. It would update slowly and you probably wouldn't have any JPEG compression. Or if you did, it would be very slow. So it's a great example of why a Raspberry Pi is better suited for certain things than a microcontroller. As far as discrete logic, well, I'm sure it's back in the 70s someone built a digital camera with discrete logic, but there'd be absolutely no reason to do it nowadays unless you were really, really bored. Another appropriate project for the Raspberry Pi was episode 81, the automatic dog treat dispenser. The premise was if your dog was at home and you were at work or on vacation or trapped in a derelict spaceship, you could log in to the Raspberry Pi using its Wi-Fi capabilities, use the camera on the Raspberry Pi to see if the dog was there, and then use the general purpose input output to control servos and motors to dispense a treat. So that was something that would be fairly difficult to do with a microcontroller, but the Raspberry Pi was perfect for it. If we had tried to use a microcontroller itself, we could probably get it to connect to the internet. You know, you could probably log into it over some sort of connection. However, you probably wouldn't have a camera. You could do everything else, but you wouldn't be able to see your dog, or if you did, the frame rate would be very slow, probably in black and white. And of course, with discrete logic, it basically wouldn't have been possible at all. Maybe you could call your dog on a landline, assuming you still had that, and beep in touch tones that could, you could identify the touch tones on the other side. So there probably would have been a way to do it, but it wouldn't have worked as well. To summarize, Raspberry Pi is good for internet related things, Wi-Fi, adding USB devices such as cameras or keyboards, and you know, having more logic or computational power. Discrete circuitry, little integrated circuits, those are good for really simple things like blinking a light or doing simple logic conversion or signal conversion, really simple things. Because if you do too much of discrete logic, you might as well use an FPGA or a microcontroller. And microcontrollers are between discrete logic and the Raspberry Pi. They've got a decent amount of computational power but limited program space and RAM. And you really can't hook up a lot of peripherals to them such as USB devices or ethernet slash Wi-Fi. So when you're making a project, think about what your project needs to do and don't go too far past that because if you're using a Raspberry Pi to blink a light, that's overkill. But if you're trying to use discrete logic to remotely feed your dog, you're gonna have a hard time. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to try a prototype I've been thinking about for a long time, a convection chimney that uses Peltiers to run the fans and heat your home. But we're not gonna build a whole home, we'll just make a little model. We'll see you then. To show you. Let's get started. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing, mm, hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In, mm, wiring them in. Can I say that? Back in 2000, I don't remember. Oh, 2012, okay. Then we can make like a jungle movie, like Predator. I think it's big enough because we don't want it to like, you know, become sentient and, and try to murder us. That, that happened in that one movie about a shop of horrors. Ah, uh, hold on, let me start over. I'm being a little muddy. Push that dog. Was your mom in this episode? We also used a Raspberry Pi for episodes 70, wait, was it 70? If your dog was at home and you were at work or Jamaica or trapped in a Deller. <laughs> the Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com.